Hi everybody, I'm Jack the Rambling Raconteur. I hope you're doing well. I hope you're having a great weekend. Uh, start to this week. This is going to be another fairy tale video. We're going to be looking at uh, comparing three different versions of the Beauty and the Beast tale. Uh, we'll begin with the 1756 version, uh, in, which was uh, written in French by Jean-Marie Le Prince de Beaumont. The version I have is translated by Maria Tatar. And it's, it's great. It's sort of the version that becomes the germ of the 1990s adaptation Disney did. One that I, of course, grew up with and many are familiar with. Um, it, it's also, you know, deeply influential in the uh, great black and white version uh, Jean Cocteau did that was in French. That was amazing. Um, then we'll look at the Frog King or Iron Heinrich, this weird coda to the fairy tale, by the Brothers Groom from the 19th century. And we'll finally close out with what, to my mind, is one of the great modern retellings of any tale. And that is, of course, The Tiger's Bride by Angela Carter from 1979. Just a marvelous, marvelous tale. Um, the spoilers will abound, so if you've never treated yourself to, the, self, to these, uh, I'll try to throw some links in the description box. I don't know if the, the Carter one's in the public domain yet, but, um, you know, enjoy. And then, you know, share your thoughts as well. So, the uh, Beaumont version, classic fairy tale, seems to have, it has one more explicitly about the um, selfish, avaricious, uh, you know, conniving older sisters of beauty or Belle. Uh, being punished at the end. They're sort of the only characters who are punished within the story. And so there's this moral uh, for them. But the, the real moral uh, within the story seems to be this idea of a young woman, a young bride, um, you know, without blemish, uh, being um, imputing goodness or kindness to this husband who seems like a beast, who is uncouth, who doesn't seem to be intelligent, is certainly not handsome, and that by imputing this goodness and kindness to him, he becomes all of those things. <laughs> and yes, somehow this version does come from the French Enlightenment, but it seems informed by, uh, you know, a strain much deeper than that in terms of gender roles in society. Um, and, and the story works. We have, of course, a family with three sisters, again, like Cinderella, and three brothers as well. Uh, and their father, a merchant, who they seem to be well off. The youngest sister, uh, Beauty, or Belle in French, uh, is, is, seems to be very kind and uh, not to be selfish, unlike her older sisters when they come on hard times, and hard times for them is they move to a cottage in the country and they sort of have a farm they have to work. Uh, they're not, they're, there's never this sense that they're like so destitute and impoverished that they have no food, um, rather that they now have to work for their food and they don't have servants. And um, the father gets lost in a forest on his return from a trip that where he still has not made, uh, regained his wealth and ends up at this unfamiliar castle. He eats a wonderful dinner. He enjoys a nice night of sleep in a bed. His clothes are clean. And on his way out, he remembers his youngest daughter asked him for some roses rather than jewels or finery or clothes. So he grabs a couple of roses. And that's when the beast appears. <laughs> of course, threatens him with his life. Uh, Beauty, this, the kindest of the sisters, is willing to sacrifice herself for her father. She wouldn't be able to you know, survive without, uh, be, in her grief at, at um, his death. So she takes his place. And then we have, we're treated to this, you know, strange um, encounter at the castle. And, uh, and, and there is this, there's never quite this sense of mortality for Beauty or Belle. Um, it, it never quite actually seems like the beast is going to, you know, attack her. Uh, he, he's very, he, 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 he asks her questions. He asks if she'll marry him. Um, but she says no, and then he, he asks again, but he's, not, he's never quite forcing the issue. Um, ultimately, uh, he allows her to return to see her family. Her sisters want the beast to kill her, so they try to keep her there for longer than the week. And she ultimately realizes, you know, sees in the mirror that she has a dream that the beast is, is laying, dying in the garden. And so she returns to the castle and finds him, where we have this wonderful moment. After having searched everywhere, she remembered her dream and ran into the garden toward the canal where she had seen Beast in her sleep. She found poor Beast stretched out unconscious and she was sure that he was dead, feeling no revulsion at his looks. She threw herself on him and realizing that his heart was still beating, she got some water from the canal and threw it on him. And it, he, go, he goes, I will, now I will die happy for I have the pleasure of seeing you one more time. No, my dear Beast, you will not die, said Beauty. You will live and become my husband. From this moment on, I give you my hand in marriage, and I swear that I belong only to you. Alas, I thought that I felt only friendship for you, but the grief I am feeling makes me realize that I can't live without you. 
Scarcely had Beauty uttered these words when the castle became radiant with light. Fireworks and music alike signaled a celebration. Uh, and she's, and, you know, and, and the beast is now uh, handsome and he's intelligent. And uh, it's interesting that in, the, in that version, in this version of the tale, the beast is explicitly not intelligent. <laughs> and he's, he's forced by the curse, you know, the fairy who cursed him not to be able to reveal his intelligence. Uh, but again, the moral very much seems to be this idea of if you're willing to just see the virtue and be virtuous and good and kind, there will be these rewards. And one of them will be that this husband you're getting is, is actually going to be a very kind and intelligent and handsome man. Um, but notice that the transformation occurs before any marriage. It's, you know, it's when she agrees to the marriage that the transformation occurs in this man. That's not quite the case with the Frog King. So the Frog King is just this very short snippet. It's incredibly well known. Some, uh, you know, scholars of fairy tales regard it as a different uh, tale type. But both Tatar and in my own reading, I think that they're, they're linked. And it's linked in this idea of the transformation in uh, the husband. And there's an interesting, you know, version with the Swan Maidens that I almost want to do like another video <laughs> later in the year on. It, just because it's such a, a different aspect uh, from the way these three relate to each other. But within the Frog King, we now have a princess. It's the Brothers Grimm, so th there's a lot more like royalty. <laughs> uh, we have this princess. There's not, a, not as many merchants. Uh, we have this princess. She's playing with this golden bobble she has. It falls into the well and she can't get it. And that's where the frog appears. And he goes, I'll get it, but you have to promise that you'll, you know, let me be your friend and eat at your table and stay at your side and sleep in your bed with you. And she thinks, whatever, <laughs> he's still a frog. He recovers it and then, you know, he's back. And the king says, well, you've got to, her father, the king, is like, you got to let the, you, 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 you made your promise, you kept your word. Um, and, you know, uh, the, the princess is not having this. She has to eat with the frog and she's disgusted. And everybody else is kind of, oh, yeah. <laughs> and then it's time, oh, the frog gets to come up to her bedroom as well. And then finally, uh, you know, the frog says, like, I need to be, I, is in bed with her. I need to be closer. I need to be closer. And that's when she just has this act of passion. Far from saying, I'm going to marry you. Like, I love you. Uh, I'm, I've missed you. And that's why I've realized I love you. She takes the frog and hurls it against the wall to kill it. And instead of a frog hitting the wall, it's a handsome prince who has his own kingdom for her. Uh, and then there's this weird coda with Iron Heinrich, who is the frog's uh, former manservant who had had, his heart was going to break from grief. So he had three iron rings put around it. And then on the way off to the prince's, you know, magical kingdom uh iron heinrich is there on the carriage and they think the carriage is breaking because it's the iron rings breaking off his heart <laughs> what a weird coda i don't know what the significance of that is but to this one i think it's very important that the transformation is no longer occurring at this act of marriage but rather when they're in a bed together um, and that there's an act of passion within the bedroom that is creating the transformation here and i think this gets to a much darker side of that tale um there, there is, there are other versions where it's not so much, you know, the, we, we hear of it as the frog and the princess kissing, but <laughs> that's not just what's happening. Um, it goes a little bit deeper than that. Uh, there are versions where the frog actually has to be beheaded. And I think those versions get even more closely at this idea that there's some type of consummation going on within the, the fairy tale to produce the transformation. Specifically the idea of um, the beheading representing what I believe it was the French, uh, it might be a different culture, referred to as the little death. Look it up if you're not sure. Um, and I think that kind of gets at that idea a little more clearly. And of course, it, it, it again, as I said, it adds, it goes a little bit, it cuts a little bit deeper in terms of what that moral would actually mean. It's not just, you know, this marriage and agreeing to this marriage that brings about this supposed transformation, but it's actually... The fulfillment and consummation of that marriage is bringing about the transformation. And that brings us to the Tiger's Bride, which inverts the, the moral and does it in a way that actually feels like a much more authentic moral. So the earlier tales have this idea of a good, virtuous, kind, you know, bride is somehow going to impute this goodness and kindness to her husband and he will then be transformed into everything she dreams of and all these good things. What Carter 
wants us to recognize, and this, as I said, massive spoilers. What Carter wants us to recognize is that many humans are by their, like, I don't want to say nature, but many humans are venal and greedy and evil, and that is their true self. They, their, their true, they, we hide through society, through fastidious, you know, clothing, um, whatever, you know, what we put on. We, we create these masks that hide the true, like, avaricious, evil nature of, um, of a person. And that that's what Carter, you know, is really trying to get us at, is not that the transformation is from something that is beast, a beast to this wonderful human, but recognizing that there are humans who behave like beasts and that therefore like the humanity and the fastidiousness is the mask. That's, that's you know, when, when it's transformed, it will reveal the beast that is within. And that's really where Carter wants us to go. We now have a uh, young Russian um, woman whose father is an inveterate gambler and he has gambled everything away in this series of cards. It looks like a three card game, which here in the Southwestern US we call gut. Uh, I learned it from an uncle who was a teacher in Texas. Um, he, he gambles away and he has a uh, king queen ace. So he thinks he's got the high hand and the beast of course has uh, three aces and he, what he wins in that final stake is the girl the narrator and uh, this is her description of the beast I never saw a man so big look so two-dimensional in spite of the quaint elegance of the beast in the old-fashioned tailcoat that might from its looks have been bought in those distant years before he imposed seclusion on himself he does not feel he need keep up with the times there is a crude clumsiness about his outlines that are on the ungainly giant side, and he has an odd air of self-imposed restraint, as if fighting a battle with himself to remain upright when he would ra far rather drop down on all fours. He throws our human aspirations to the godlike, sadly awry, poor fellow. Only from a distance would you think the beast not much different from any other man, although he wears a mask, with a man's face painted most beautifully on it. Oh yes, a beautiful face, but one with too much formal symmetry of feature to be entirely human. One profile of his mask is the mirror image of the other. Too perfect, uncanny. He wears a wig too, false hair tied at the nape with a bow, a wig of the kind you see in old-fashioned portraits. A chaste silk stock stuck with pearl hides his throat, and gloves of blonde kid that are yet so huge and clumsy they do not seem to cover hands. He is a carnival figure made of paper mache and crepe hair, and yet he has the devil's knack at cards. Uh, and it, his masked voice echoes um, as from a great distance, um, and he has such a growling impediment in his speech that only his valet, who understands him, can interpret for him. This, we have this marvelous description of what is very clearly a beast in human clothing. Um, and the, the way, you know, he dresses like an, an old-fashioned noble, and that, bis that, bit, that sentence, um, that marvelous sentence where it talks about how it's everything he can do to keep himself upright when he would much rather be on, you know, all fours. And I think that sentence is, is where Carter is, you know, the description of the beast is everything. But that, that key in there is where Carter's drawing our attention, which is this idea that although we think of ourselves as humans and, and, and we, we distinguish ourselves from the beasts and the animals, in many ways humans behave in a way that is unkind and cruel and so much more consciously cruel and evil than that of an, you know, an animal that walks on all fours. And while the beast may be struggling to hold himself upright, the narrator's father is firmly not just on all fours, but is just a disaster. Um, and so winning, you know, th this new bride, uh, the beast has her taken to his castle and he then says that he, you know, the, the, um, the stake that, that would allow her to be returned would be if she would undress for him. And in a sense, you know, this unmasking idea. And she, of course, refuses. Uh, and ultimately, he unmasks himself and reveals that he is a beast. He is a tiger. He's not a human. And she's kind of known this the whole time. And then as she sees, you know, her father's response at receiving money and being able to, like, be free and such, uh, the bride herself undresses before the beast, reveals her true self. And then we have this absolutely astonishing ending slowly slowly he began to drag his heavy gleaming weight across the floor towards me a tremendous throbbing as of the engine that makes the earth turn filled the little room he had begun to purr 
The sweet thunder of this purr shook the old walls, made the shutters batter the windows until they burst apart, and let in the white light of the snowy moon. Tiles came crashing down from the roof. I heard them fall into the courtyard far below. The reverberations of this purring rocked the foundations of the house. The walls began to dance. I thought, it will all fall. Everything will disintegrate. He dragged himself closer and closer to me until I felt the harsh velvet of his head against my hand, then a tongue abrasive as sandpaper. He would lick the skin off me. And each stroke of his tongue ripped off skin after successive skin, all the skins of a life in the world, and left behind a nascent patina of shining hairs. My earrings turned back to water and trickled down my shoulders. I shoved the drops off my beautiful fur. And so, as I had said, Carter inverts the tale, and so it is not that this bride is going to redeem this beast and turn him into a human. This beast is instead going to reveal who he truly is. She will reveal who she truly is. And they will no longer, you know, have to be part of this, the, the hypocrisy of this human society that she has been forced to inhabit. Um, there is one other aspect that seems to be like a pretty uh, clear nod in that direction. In addition to all of, you know, the shaking of the house. Uh, and that is that where in Beaumont we had the, the first encounter with the beast involves the, you know, beauty's father grabbing the roses. In this one, in The Tiger's Bride, she goes to uh, take a rose for her to send to her father, this white rose. And um, when she does, the thorns cause her to bleed on the white rose. And I think that symbolism is pretty... Um, clear what that's supposed to be and sends that and so there are just these little ways where Carter takes the aspects of the original fairy tale and then makes it very you know inverts it makes it just really clear um, that the the moral of this like beautiful transformation needs to be looked at from a, a more realistic and authentic perspective and it's why it's one of my all-time favorite tales um, the other text that Carter is very explicit in referencing would be uh, Jonathan Swift's Gulliver's Travels and the fourth book where Gulliver meets the Huynhims where, uh, which is an island of horses <laughs> who view humans as these like just awful beasts um, and just terrible and unintelligent and you know, uh, and the Hunhims are the only ones who can speak and have these like noble lofty goals. And so that's the, the, the type of twist that Carter's pushing at and it's just a marvelous tale. So I don't know if you've ever read any of these three, you know, what is your favorite? Let me know what you're thinking. Um, and as I said, I'll, I'll put the links in the description box to the stories I can find. So as always, thank you. Bye.